about the sushi thing. I don't know about anything bigger than myself and my family. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay? I came here four years ago from Oklahoma. That was during the first round of economic hardships for our country. I had lost my job, and my husband's job couldn't support our family of seven. We have eight now. We were without options because we had five small children and no viable income. So we came home for my husband back to where he was born. And although we had lost our house in Oklahoma, we began a life here with my husband working offshore. In three years, we were able to turn our financial situation around, and I got a job working for the local paper, and I set about making a new beginning for us. We worked hard, and we saved our money, and recently we were able to buy a house again. Three days after we signed the closing papers, the moratorium hit. My husband was again without viable work, and since we spent every ounce of our savings on our home, we met with the devastating reality that we were back to square one. My husband went immediately to work on his company shop, making $10 an hour with mandatory no overtime. And now that little job that I took to save for our house is all that stands between us and losing our next home. I spent all day yesterday going to the food stamp office, to the Medicaid office, and to the WIC office. So for this Independence Day, I get to become a dependent of the state and of the country. I put my claim into BP, that was six weeks ago. I've left no less than 10 messages. And when I finally did get through, I was given a list of things that I need to provide to them and told to wait till the adjuster calls me. No one has called me. That list included, besides the tree's worth of other documents, a letter from my husband's employer explaining that our government had ended our income and left my family to ruin. We don't matter. Unfortunately, our company, my husband's company, still has contracts with BP, and their lawyers said it wouldn't be good for that company to write such a letter. So they told us to wait. Recently, I had the opportunity to go to Platinum Parish, Louisiana with the Louisiana Press Association. I didn't have to go, but I wanted to see for myself what the, con the circumstances were on our coastline. And I did see. I saw a parish president, Billy Dungesser, who is screaming for help for his people. He's been screaming for a while now, 70 some odd days. I saw an exhausted Louisiana wildlife and fisheries workers, Coast Guard, BP people that are on the ground, torn up with grief over the loss of an ecosystem. I saw our governor, Bobby Jindal, worn out from a never-ending amount of federal and BP-related incompetence. And yet, he still took the time to talk to me. Nobody else has talked to me. He turned to talk to me. You say what you want about him, but he took the time to grieve with me. I looked into the eyes of our state symbol, the brown pelican and other wildlife, who are lost and dripping with the blood of our Mother Earth. But the most startling thing that day is not what I saw, but what I heard. Nothing. On a boat in a marsh that should have been crawling in life, I heard nothing. There were no birds, no insects. The Earth is dead. The plant life soaking in crude is dead or dying. Upon returning, I couldn't get the images out of my head. The voice of the fifth generation fisherman, who while the sixth generation was sitting at his feet, wept over his uncertain future. The waves that were blistered with oil rising and falling, the collective sound of a culture and a people that are crying out for assistance. While fingers are pointed and hearings are announced and special sections, sessions are talked about, our children are poisoned. And our lives and our livelihoods are being lost. To what lasting effect the oil spill will have on our people and environment, that remains to be seen. But I say, let that effect be the story of not only our survival, but of our overcoming, just as the Acadian story has always read. There were other things that I saw that day, things that made me swell with pride to live among the few such as these. Those who keep working without respirators, without the equipment they need, without the hope of a paycheck in the near future. Two stories of the warriors of this nation, like this Kendra, the fishermen, the crabbers, the offshore oil worker, those who carry the torch of the day in their back pocket, because their hands are full, you see. Those who, in the words of 
Bobby Jones will not wait to save our coach. They won't wait to save our families. And they will always offer their hands to service for our people. I contacted Marla Cooper, the Platinum Parish Government Council person, and I asked her what she needed. She said, did they need food, supplies, diapers, and pet food? I talked to Billy Nungesser, who's the parish president, and he was worried that if I, I organized a food drive, that that might put the businesses there at, out of business, on the verge of, for, of closure. He asked that maybe we could collect money to buy food vouchers for the local stores. That way we could help the economy and the families. So that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to work with the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts to collect, collect diapers and, boy, and pet food. I'm going to uh, do everything that I can, and weeks from now, I'm going to go back to your area, Ms. Kendra, and I'm going to take with me a caravan of people, and we're going to have diapers, and we're going to have pet food, and we're going to have vouchers for your stores, and you tell me who needs them, because I'm going to go door to door, and I'm going to hand them to them, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping to hand them an envelope full of money so they can pay their mortgages. Thank you. Because that's what needs to be done, and I'm challenging everybody who can hear me. If you can hear me, stand up for God's sake and do something. 